How do you track something that barely touches the ground and leaves almost no trail? Right now, across the east coast of Australia, highly trained detectives are on the case. Combing through fire grounds, under thick brush, and through trees for evidence that, to most of us, is almost invisible. These detectives keep their eyes peeled, their coats clean, and their noses wet, while searching to find what they've been trained to detect. Koala scat. This is a job for koala detection dogs. I'm Carlo Ricci, and this is Scat Chat. Join me in WWF as we get to the bottom of what fascinating things scat or poo can teach us about the animals that made it, the homes they live in, and the problems they face. We'll also chat about what you can do at home to help your favourite animals thrive in the wild. On today's program, I'm joined by Tanya Pritchard from WWF, who is working on an incredibly ambitious program to double the number of koalas in Australia. Tanya, welcome to Scat Chat. Oh, very excited to be talking about my favourite topic. Scat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to just get out, before we jump into the discussion, I just want to talk a little bit about koalas with you and run a couple of the myths that I think I know about koalas. And you as an expert can tell me how really are. So the big one is, do koalas sleep all the time? Well, they do sleep quite a lot of the time. We know from the work that we do with koalas that they do move and some koalas can move really long distances, particularly when they're looking for a mate. All right. And now here's the second myth that I want to test. Do all koalas have chlamydia? No, thank goodness for that, because chlamydia is a really debilitating and devastating disease that is having a real impact uh, on their survival in the wild. And so, yes, it, it is something that is infectious and be, can be carried, obviously, um, in between koalas, but no, not, not all koalas have chlamydia. All right, well then, let's get into the real reason we're here, Tanya, which is to talk about scat. And I want to talk about koala scat with you because it's a crazy thing, right? It smells like eucalyptus. It tastes like eucalyptus. Have you tasted it? <laughs> Look, I, I, no, I, I know they, they smell They smell really good. Um, what do they look like? What are we looking for? Koala scats are, are fairly distinctive. They're quite hard on the outside and they're usually a dark colour, you know, dark brown, dark grey, can be a little bit yellowish sometimes. And they are sort of have a, a slightly ridge-like sort of cylindrical shape. A chocolate bullet's probably um, a pretty accurate um, size description, though it really does depend on the size of the koala. So if you've got a big meaty koala, it's going to have a big chunky pellet. You're immediately getting information on the koala you're tracking once you see the poo. You can kind of get an estimate on the size. Absolutely. There's a lot you can tell from a single scat. What it's been eating, uh, whether it has disease. It can also tell us like, you know, where they are in the landscape. So which corridors they're using and also whether it's male or female or whether it's a uh, joey. And the, all those things sort of provide us with vital information for how we can best protect them. So which areas should we be focusing on um, in terms of their habitat and where we need to link habitats up so that they can move safely across the landscape. And how do you find the scat? I mean, I want to picture myself, I'm out there in the bush, I'm traipsing around, I'm looking for koala scat. I know that it looks like a delicious chocolate bullet. I know it <laughs> smells sweet and tasty, but I can't eat it. We've established that, Tanya. Yeah. But how do I find it? Look out for what you think might be a really tasty looking gum tree, a very healthy, vigorous, big tree, and you search around it for um, in about a metre wide um, perimeter around the tree and um, sort of scrabble around in the leaf litter and find the scats that way. Or you can use uh, scent detection dogs, which are specially trained to actually find scats. And they are over 300% more likely to be able to find those scat with their amazing noses. So, yeah, we, we use um, scent detection dogs as well. Tell me a little bit about the work of these koala detection dogs and why they're so effective. Because they have such amazing scent, you can train a um, scent detection dog to 
basically detect a scat that is even over six months old. So it may be fairly dry and shriveled up and they can still detect um, these scats. And when the scent detection dog actually finds one, it kind of goes down and sits there with its nose pointing towards where the scat is. And sometimes they'll also help you to find the scat amongst the leaf litter because it might be actually quite buried down amongst the leaves. And I mean, are these dogs that are trained from birth to track down koala scat or are these you know, these are old dogs that have been taught new tricks. What what is it? There's actually a real mix out there. There's um some uh, scent detection dogs that are bitsits that have come from the pound, um, whereas others are like trained Springer Spaniels that, you know, have been trained from puppies. So there's a real mix out there. Um, and it really depends on the personality of the dog. They really need to be very committed and dedicated and kind of single-minded um, because they're, they really are working dogs. It sounds a bit like they're that sort of genius detective that comes into the crime scene, like, oh, you mustn't talk to the dog, you know. <laughs> that dog, they're, they're, they're working their magic, just let it go. Yeah, the trainers definitely don't want you patting the dog um, when it's when it's in working mode, that's for sure. To find the actual koalas, we use other technology like drones um, that use heat sensing technology to find them in the wild. There's all sorts of kind of AI technology that's being developed to make sure that we're accurate when we fly the drones across the forest. Are you saying that this is sort of like a Skywatch program that will eventually lead to a Terminator-style situation <laughs> where people have to come back in time to stop us from trying to save koalas in order to save the planet? Is that uh, where we're going with this, Tanya? No, no, I hope not. I hope that we get to a point where, you know, we're actually able to more accurately identify how many koalas are there and where they are and the best patches of bush that we need to save so we can really get behind the recovery of this amazing, iconic animal. Uh, Animal. Let's talk a little bit about why this is necessary. I mean, training of scat detection dogs and this, these advanced AI drones that are tracking koalas. The necessity is there because koalas have recently, as recently as February 2022, been declared endangered right in the east coast of Australia. So their numbers are, are going down. Why is that? Why are koalas now so threatened? It has been a steady decline back right from colonisation of Australia. There were millions of koalas um, over 8 million koalas were um, across the continent. In the early 1900s, millions of them were killed for their, for their fur. And so I think in one year alone, there was a, over a million pellets or, or koala uh, furs um, sent over to, um, to the US. So they really suffered, and particularly in the southern states, um, they were basically went extinct. And they were actually, some of the areas down there were recolonised. Um, they bought koalas from other areas and, and recolonised parts of, of, of Victoria. Uh, with koalas. And then since that time, uh, through a combination of, of habitat clearing, drought, fires, dogs, cars, the numbers have continued to decline where in the last 20 years, you know, we've seen numbers halve again uh, to the point now where we think there may only be 100,000 koalas left. And we're just so scared that that, you know, there may be that point or that threshold where they can't, there's not enough of them to sort of find each other in the wild and, and maybe they will become extinct in the wild, which would just be such a tragedy. Whatever koalas we have left are just, every single one of those koalas is so important um, in trying to recover. And now that, you know, they've been um, classified as endangered, we're hoping that that is going to help uh, to improve our nature laws um, to provide better protection of their habitat, which is continuing continuing to be cleared uh, across the east coast of Australia. Is that now the biggest threat to koalas is habitat loss or are there other threats as well? Yeah, no, habitat loss is definitely the number one, um, along with, you know, climate change and the fact that we're having all these massive bushfires and floods and things like that, these events which um, do have a devastating impact upon koalas. We know that there was over 6,000 koalas um, in New South Wales um, which were affected by those bushfires in um, 2019, 2020. And obviously, you know, continuing urbanisation and, and koalas like to live in the same places that we do. 
What makes a tree attractive to a koala? I just have this inner sense, I think, you know, having having just, you know, spent so many times um, being out on my hands and knees looking for koala poo and just really getting to, to know what a good tree looks like. And so I can be driving along and see a, a tree and just think, oh, that looks so tasty. And and <laughs> pretty much 95 times, 95% uh, of the time I'm right and I will actually find. It is delicious. You'll go up there. There and you'll just yeah. have a, you'll be like, man, that was a tasty tree. Yeah. Are you the reason we're losing the habitat, Tanya? Are you eating all of these tasty trees? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm planting them. I, we um, we have some amazing tree planting programs working with all sorts of land care and community groups um, across the east coast of Australia and I, I spend lots of my time planting koala food trees. Is, and this is something that people can, can do themselves, right? If they have backyard space or they live in a koala area, they could be planting trees that koalas like. Well, WWF Australia has an amazing and ambitious program called Regenerate Australia. And it's uh, basically a movement we, that you can join. We're hoping that everyone in Australia is going to play their bit and do their bit to help us restore this amazing country, not just for koalas, but for us as well. So you can get online and um, become Become part of our Regenerate Australia. If our listeners are looking to plant some trees that they think will attract koalas or help koalas, what's the what's the tree like when you're out there driving Tanya and you're getting a little bit peckish and you start scouring left and right for a really delicious looking tree that you're going to curl up in and have a tasty little drive by feast? What trees are you looking for? What's the tree? The koala caviar of the eucalyptus tree world is probably what you call a red gum um, or some people call it a blue gum. It's eucalyptus teratocornus and that's probably one of the number one favourites. But there are quite a few eucalypts out, out of the sort of the hundreds of that are there. You know, there's over 30 that koalas will eat and it just depends on where you are, you, you know, whether you're in, in New South Wales or Queensland, you know, which species of eucalypts. But yeah, there's definitely um, preferred koala food trees out there of which um, the koala caviar is definitely the blue gum. Is it like a, a grape variety in that way that the region and the water and everything will make for a different blue gum variety? Like, oh, that's mm, that's a delicious South Australian blue gum or that's oh, what a lovely Queensland red gum. Yeah, they, they do have preferences. They're, you know, different koalas do have different preferences and, you know, that you'll, you'll come across a, a tree in the landscape and it'll just be hammered. You know, the koalas will have almost kind of stripped it bare because they just particularly love that tree, whereas others look like they haven't been touched. So we're not not really sure why that is, but um, there's definitely preferred trees out there. With these programs that you've talked about in terms of people planting trees to help in you know regenerate and provide new areas for koalas to go, what is the time frame on that? How long between planting a tree and koalas arriving? We have planted trees and then 18 months later, we've found koalas in them. So particularly in high rainfall uh, areas where the trees grow really fast and they might get up to above two metres, uh, we'll find uh, koalas in those trees. And I was talking with a landholder the other day who had said, I have to go out and plant some more koala food trees because she keeps finding koalas in her fig tree. And so she went out and she planted a whole heap of trees. And then the next morning she came out and there was a mother koala with a joey on its back sitting on the ground and it was holding on to this little baby tree that she'd put in the ground and was chewing away on the top of it. So in some places, you know, we can't plant them fast enough. The koalas are literally eating them as, as fast as we plant them. Now, Tanya, just I want you to imagine, I know it might be hard that I'm not a multi-thousand acre landholder growing sweet, sweet barley and beautiful wheat. Oh, and you should see the heads on the wheat crop I have. Now, just imagine that that's not my lifestyle and I just live in the outer suburbs or on a small country block. What are some other things that I could be doing to help? Well, if you are into looking for scats, we've developed a new koala scat accounting method. And so by going out there and finding these scats with a very spe specific technique, so we, we have this very specific technique that we've developed and it's 
all about the ca accounting, the, the number of scats in a certain area to sort of give us um, a koala account. And so these koala accounts uh, can tell us, you know, how many koalas are uh, in that area. Can I ask, or is it like a trade secret, what this specific technique is? Or is this like a dark art that... Only... No, no. This this is a this is an art that we're wanting to share with everybody because we'd like everybody to get on board with this koala accounting, uh -huh. and so we've actually had this method um, written up and approved by what's called Accounting for Nature, mm -hmm. and so that information is all now freely available on the internet uh, for people to use, and we're also providing training for citizen scientists, so mums and dads and kids that would like to come out and and actually get trained in in how to use this koala accounting method can can come along and help us find out what's going on in their local area uh, for koalas. And at what point do I have to take photos of my receipts? Is that is that part like do I do that just at the end of financial year? <laughs> well, we do. The receipt is the photo of the koala scat. So we take photos of all the koala scats so we can actually really um, demonstrate that um, to make sure that we are finding the right scat, that it's not a possum or a glider or something like that. See, I get very excited and I can imagine that my children won't be as excited at the idea if I'm like, hey, guys. We're going to go out and we're going to try and find as much koala poo as we can over the weekend. And I, I get really excited by that. And I, I hope my kids do. I'm sure you would make it fun. I'm sure you've got lots yeah. of um, good ideas for yeah. making that a very fun activity. And you can also obviously, um, you know, get onto the WDF Australia's website and have a look uh, at the Koalas Forever program and, and adopt a koala or something like that. Or you could come along to one of our tree planting programs as well and plant your own tree. Where is the strangest place that people have found koalas. Koalas turn up in all sorts of crazy places because they do seem to, um, you know, climb up the poles in people's porches and, and things like that. And occasionally you'll even see a koala swimming across a creek um, to get to the other side. That's that classic joke of why the koala across the creek. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, koalas have even been known to climb up people's Christmas trees. Unfortunately, we do find that it's often when they are affected by a disease and their eyesight um, is affected that that's when they will um, make those mistakes and uh, come come into people's homes and, and climb poles and fences and things that they shouldn't. Well, yeah, I wanted to briefly talk about the disease affecting koalas. We talked a lot about habitat loss, but this is one of the, the big things that's impacting particularly koalas' ability to breed, things like chlamydia. And am I right that WWF, you guys have been working on like immunization programs for s certain communities of koalas? Yeah, that's exactly right. So working with the Kurumban Wildlife Hospital to uh, trial some pretty amazing vaccines, which are going to hopefully uh, really improve the outcomes for koalas that um, are affected by chlamydia disease. And uh, we know that over 50% of the koalas coming into care in some of these areas is, is because of chlamydia. So there's a vaccine which is quite similar in some ways to the COVID-19 vaccine in that it's a, a two-shot vaccine, so it needs to be given sort of two shots four weeks apart. And so the koalas actually need to be held in a special purpose-built facility um, in, you know, between the vaccines and then they're released. And um, yeah, we're, we're very hopeful that that's going to improve the outcomes. Yeah, because they're terrible at keeping appointments, aren't they, girls? You, know? <laughs> you try and right. set a date with one and they just never show up. I yep. tell you what. And and trying to, um, we do have, you know, programs where we do need to catch them and collect them out of trees for various things and to collect samples and test them for disease. But, um, yeah, it's, it's much better when you don't have to keep recapturing them all the time. I can imagine. It has been a delight talking to you about not just koala scat but koalas in general. To come back briefly to one last thing about scat, though, I have to ask, like, as a person who works every day with koala scat, um, what is your favourite scat fact 
It doesn't have to be koalas necessarily. Well, I love to play the scat game with school kids <laughs> where we have a yeah. whole <laughs> heap of different scats which we've got from different animals and we get the kids to identify, you know, which scat belongs to which animal. And right. um, there's always a tricky one and um, that I like to include in there. And um, it's the actually the, the dung beetle scat, if you like. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And um, the kids always think, oh, is that a possum or is that belong to some... Uh, turtle or something but it's it's actually not belonging to any animal it's it's the dung beetles rolled up little scat so yeah hi oh, little little trick scat in there yeah that's right i actually found out this amazing scat fact the other day tanya you probably are already across this but you know that a giraffe and a goat have the exact same size scat that's very interesting yeah <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> yeah they're part of the same family that they like take every little bit of nutrient out of what they're eating and so their poo is exactly the same size because it's just waste that comes out yeah yeah so if you want to if you want i got a whole bunch of giraffes get back in my house you can start taking it around surprise the kids <laughs> like, oh that's a goat I'm like oh think again yeah that's right that's a very tricky one well, Tanya, it has been an absolute delight talking to you about koalas. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to us on Scat Chat. And good luck in your work out there doubling the koala population. Thank you. And I hope to see you out there planting a tree or looking for some scat very soon. Oh, I'll be out there. I'll be dragging those kids out. We'll see all the poo we can find. Excellent. Thank you for joining me for Scat Chat with WWF. If you want to find out more about how you can help koalas, head to wwf.org.au forward slash scatchat to get involved and follow us here to stay in the loop. Join me next time as I get to the bottom of a scat that glistens in the sun and chat about how this scat can be used as an indicator for the health of the environment of the animal who makes it.